Uh, there's all these frameworks that I play with it, mostly around Java and Python, mostly Python, right? Um, I, I'm gonna show some Python uh, Jupyter notebooks. On the previous video, I talked about traditional AI, and then in this video, I'm gonna talk about generative AI. Uh, there's some demos that I'm gonna show probably on the third uh, video, uh, and and uh, in the third video, probably also gonna cover uh, the POCs. Uh, I won't be able to cover the 180, but I want to cover the the ones that I found the best which are 32, okay? So if just like situate you guys on this repo, uh, here I have a list of uh, use cases what we can do and use traditional AI and generative AI. It's also a curated list of libraries that I recommend and I did POCs. Um, then I have a list of papers like AWS recommends and some other papers like I'm reading. Um, I have some modules I recommend you guys take a look some some good articles and posts to read and some videos right so there's a lot of resources you can use here uh to learn and so on the first video i was basically covering the first uh jupyter notebook about traditional ai now on this one we're gonna see about um gen ai so let's uh start there right so uh, machine learning uh, kind of started from the 50s, but um, most of advances around uh, machine learning, deep learning, and Gen AI are from uh, the last decades, uh, pretty much, right? So from 2012, uh, big big things, are probably like 2014 is the GANs, uh, the Generative Adversion Networks we're going to go over later on this notebook. Um, AlphaGo um, with uh, reinforcement learning, um, Transformers with like a game changing architecture. We're gonna talk about this uh, a little bit more on this notebook. Uh, GPT, which is like the poster child of uh, LLMs nowadays. Um, and then like from that, uh, DALI, uh, Stable Diffusion, and a bunch of other Transformers, right? And uh, architectures. So let's get started. So here are some use cases, some of the things we can do with Gen AI, right? So we can do uh, text uh, generation. Uh, we are able to create a new text like articles, story, blog posts, and conversations. We can create uh, images, like we can create new images, such as thoughts, artwork, and designs. And we can also apply styles, like we can create logos, we can create um like let's say you want a medieval picture you can do that if you want a pixel art you can do that too so we can incorporate style uh, we also can generate music uh we can compose music melodies and sound effects we can generate videos uh such as animations um i don't know if you guys saw but there's a project called sora uh made a quite a splash and there's an open source version of it called open sora as well you guys can take a look uh, we can do um, data generation, so this is good for synthetical uh, data for uh, testing, training, right, and you, even for engineering, this is quite useful. Uh, we can do like style transfer, we can uh, transfer style between images and music and text. We can do image to image translation uh, from one domain to another. We can do text to image synthesis. So we can generate images from text descriptions. We can do dialogue generation. We can engage in conversation responding uh, to user input, like for chatbots or assistants. Uh, we can do creative writing. We can uh, generate creative writing, such as like poetry, stories, uh, and uh, even uh, lyrics for songs as well. Okay, so quite a lot of use cases we can do with Gen AI. Um, so let's just step back a little bit. Uh, before we go deep into LLMs, right? So the thing that we're missing from the first notebook is deep learning. So deep learning is another subfield of machine learning that focus on neural network. So first of all, there's no evidence that's exactly how our brain works, right? So we believe it's something like that, but we don't know like 100% for sure. So uh, neural networks are a type of module that's inspired by human brain. 
uh, that consists in layers of neurons that process input data and produce output data. So deep neural networks are neural networks with many layers and a couple of complex learnings and patterns. So you're going to have your input neurons, you're going to have hidden layers, and you're going to have output neurons, right? You're also going to have biases neurons. And this thing is quite complex and interesting. Uh, the prediction happened on the last neurons. Um, and I will go back to that in a moment, right? So there is this uh, specialized form of um, neural network that was created in the 80s, I think 88, if I, if I remember, called Recurrent Neural Network, RNN. So a Recurrent Neural Network, RNN, is a type of neural network where it's designed to process sequences of data, and they're commonly used uh, for text and speech processing. So here, uh, there's an image, and uh, this one here is forward only, right? And, and this one here, we can see it, it goes back and forth, right? And that happens with something called propagation, right? So there's backward propagation and forward propagation. So backward propagation, uh, backward propagation are and ends, is a propagation that updates their weights and biases during the training. This involves computing the gradient of the loss function. If you guys remember the first notebook, we talk about what's a loss function, right? In respect of weights and biases of the network and forward propagations are an end of forward propagations to compute the output of the network given an input sequence this involves passing an input sequence through the network computing output of each step um, so here's just another example there's one thing called long shot term memory lstm which is a type of error and they're designed to capture long-term dependencies in data they are capable of learning patterns that are separated by long sequence of data. So some use cases of neural networks, specifically recurrent neural networks are uh, natural language processing, NLP, speech recognition, time series predictions and anomaly detection, music composition, handwriting recognition uh, through images and video activity recognition. Now let's talk about a different kind of neural network called convolutional neural network or CNNs. So convolutional neural network CNNs are a type of neural networks that are designed to process images. They are commonly used for image recognition in a computer vision. Here we have an image of uh, some architecture of a typical convolutional neural, uh, neural network. So CNNs uh, use convolutional layers to extract features from images, right? So we start from images. Uh, and these layers apply filters, they input image and detect patterns such as edges, corners, and textures. Um, there's a lot of use case for those, like we can do image classification, object detection, image segmentation, face recognition, uh, magical uh, imaging, gesture uh, recognition, image synthesis, and also can be used for self-driving cars. Now let's talk about transformers. Transformers are, are the big deal. Uh, this is a paper from 2017, if I remember. And they're a type of neural network architecture that is being used with successfully uh, in managing AI tasks. Basically, you can copy this architecture and use for text, for video. Of course, there are some changes, but you can generalize most of it. Um, and they're based on self-attention mechanism. Attention is something very, very complex. Uh, I won't go over in details, but uh, the model has a long range of dependencies in data. Transformers have been used in many applications, search, language modeling, NLP, translation, and image generation, right? So you have um, a positional encoding. Uh, here you have uh, input uh, embedding, you have output embedding, and you know you you end the thing with a softmax which is going to have like some probability uh, distribution um there is a very good video on three blue and brown that explain multi higher attention and this in detail right but uh, the architecture is quite uh, complex but what you need to know is that there's many use cases for transformers like uh, natural language processing language modeling question answering, speech recognition, same thing for casting, and image recognition. Now, talking about LLMs, we need to understand something called embeddings, right? So embeddings are a way to represent data in a lower dimensional space. 
They're commonly used in Gen AI to represent words, images, and other types of data. So em embedders are learning during the train, and they kept capture the relationship between different data points. So what we can see here on this uh, three-dimensional space is that um, imagine if you have a word that's like a woman and a man, and, and you can see they have like a, 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 a symmetrical distance between them. And the, and the same uh, distance is proportional between a son and a daughter, right? So if, if we plot like an image of a dog and a word dog, they will be very close uh, on, on this uh, chart, right? So uh, there are some metric functions that can use to measure the similarity of the words, right? Like we can go from Euclidean distance, Manhattan distance, um, but one of the ones that are most used uh, is called cosine similarity to find the similarity between these two embeddings and then you can do semantical search. So here is a simple code using uh, transformers. I'm using the BERT model uh, and we're gonna do some embeddings. So you need a tokenizer uh, and a module. So uh, here I'm using this library from Hugging Face. I'm using transformers and I'm loading the, the BERT module. And here I have a sentence. I love coding GNI applications. Then I'm gonna use the tokenizer. Um, and then from that tokenizer, I'm gonna have outputs. And from that loud outputs, I'm gonna get the last hidden state. And then I can print that out. So here are the embeddings. Uh, these are also known as tensors. And you might heard the word tensor this is all about matrix uh, multiplications under the hood. Uh, you might heard a framework like called TensorFlow or PyTorch. They're all about tensors. So what is a tensor? Well, tensor is a key data structure used in creating training and testing neural networks. Uh, they are a generalization of factors in matrix because they have hangs. Um, so they have an object that represents a haze of numbers. So uh, imagine like this, right? So we, we have a tensor Hank zero is a scalar, meaning it's a single value. Uh, we might have a tensor Hank one, which might be a vector, a list of uh, values, like one dimensional. You might have a matrix, which is like Hank two, will be a 2D matrix. And you might have a 3D matrix or N, N dimensional array, right? That will be your Hank. So here I have a simple code with NumPy, just showing like some scalar value, some vectors, some to-do matrix, and 3D matrix, and then we are printing some tensors, right? What NumPy uh, gives you is a lot of APIs to manipulate uh, this matrix uh, and do matrix operations, right? That's why this is good on the GPU. GPU is very good to do this kind of a math. Now, Okay, you, you got your embeddings, right? You tokenize it, like if you go back to, to, to the code we have here, right? So I have this sentence, um, and then you're gonna create some embeddings, right? And you use a tokenization and you have all these tensors. So what do you do with them? Well, one thing you can do is put on a vector database, right? So a vector database, a database that store vectors in a high dimensional space. It allows to query the vectors based on similarity of the other vectors. This is used for many GNI tasks, such as image search, recommendation systems, and content generation. So here's some landscape of vector databases. You might find some traditional SQL databases here, and also NoSQL. Uh, you might think, uh, see here Cassandra, Redis and Elasticsearch as from NoSQL, uh, and Postgres as from SQL. And there's some like uh, specific uh, vector database like Vespa, LensDB, Amilviews, and Chroma. I did POC with some of those. There's Pinecom as well, which you know provide a very nice service on top of AWS. I POC several of these uh, vector databases. Uh, I, I, I think I'm gonna show some of those uh, on the next video on the POCs. So, okay, so here's just a list of some popular vector databases. And now we can talk about large language modules, right? So a large language module is a language module that are a Gen AI model that's trained on a large corpus of text data. So this could be 40 terabyte, 100 terabyte, or uh, even more. Uh, so they're capable of generating human text, human-like text engaging conversations. So large language modules or LOM have been used for many applications such as 
chatbots, content generation, translation, and many other use cases. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people just associate LLM as a chatbot because for many people, uh, uh, that's like the main use case, right? But uh, LLMs are more than that. And the right to see LLM is more like um, as an operational system, as an OS, where, you know, you, you're going to plug some video, you're going to plug some terminal, you're going to plug some blog, uh, some, some browser, right? And LLM is like the engine uh, of all of that, right? Um, recently, if you looked some of the product announcements like GPT-40 or even like this week, the Google I.O. 24 uh, products like Google, all the new products are embedded with uh, Gen AI features, right? And that's the how to add more and more we're going to see Gen AI products going on. I think yesterday was seeing some article on Expedia, how they want to use Gen AI as well to be able to generate like uh, plans when like you're going to trip to some place, you want to plan what you're going to do uh, with the places you want to see and things like that. And they're also using Gen AI to do that, right? Um, so chat GPT, um, so what means GPT? It means generative pre-trained transformer. Uh, GPT, you probably heard about it, is the poster child of LLMs and transformers architecture. GPT is a large language module that's based on GPT series. So uh, it's capable of generating human-like text responses to input. And GPT is being used for many applications such as chatbot, conventional agents, and creative writing. So here, before, if you remember, I showed some codes using the BERT module. And so here I have some, just some comparison between BERT and GPT. Okay. Now, so you guys have an idea of how big and cost of this thing is, right? So here are some modules. So we have GPT from OpenAI and we have Llama from Facebook. So here I put the sources from the internet where I got these numbers, right? But for instance, for GPT-3, uh, you can have a module with 175 billion parameters, and this is going to cost $4.6 million to train and takes 34, uh, 34 days. GPT-4, which has 100 trillion parameters, it costs $2.6 billion, right? And took 100 days to train. Llama 2 from Facebook. Llama 2 is very interesting. Uh, they have a module which has the parameters, which... Um, is 140 giga and the model is just a program in C it's like 500 lines of C uh, and then in Lama 2 there's Lama 3 as well out right but I have the data for uh, Lama 2 so they have 70 billion parameters right it cost 20 million uh, to train it in 22 days so the reality is like uh, these companies are not doing pre-training all the time because you see how much it costs and how long it takes and this whole thing is very involved right it's not not easy or fast to do that uh, so what happens is like they train one or two times per year and then they do something called fine turning right which which can give you some benefits um but so so you see the dimension how cost and long it takes to do fine turning uh sorry to do pre-training pre you won't be doing pre-training all the time right look look imagine your company to pre-train a module like that, right? It, it's crazy. Um, in GPT, you cannot because it's a closed source proprietary module. Although, although the name is OpenAI, it's not open, right? But Llama is Facebook, it's true open source, so you can actually train it if you want. But, uh, you know, you see the cost. So uh, a good alternative is fine turning. There's other alternatives to turn the module um, through prompt engineering, other things we can do uh, to improve the results even without doing pre-training. Here I have, uh, I found this on the internet as well. So you see uh, the Lama 2 paper, it took this amount of GPU hours, right in AO100, um, very good GPU to train the model. And this was this many hours, this many days, uh, these years renting, this will take like 21 years, right? If you rent AWS, uh, 2X, uh, 24X large instance with eight GPUs, right? And will cost this per hour. Um, so just, giving you guys some sense of the sizes for uh, GPT-4. So the training size is equivalent of uh, books in a shelves for one for 13 tokens, right? It's 650 kilometers 
of long line of library shelves, right? Uh, the compute size um, is 7 million years on a mid-sized laptop with 100 gigaflops. And the model size um, is a size of Excel sheet for 1.8 uh, trillion parameters. Um, this is like 30,000 fields of football fields sized Excel sheets, right? So you guys can see how big this thing actually is. Okay, so the next thing we need to talk about is prompt engineering. And prompt engineering, um, I know some engineers get upset with this term because they say it is not engineering, right? But when you use LOM, you need to deal with prompt engineering, right? Uh, especially if you're not going to fine turn uh, and, you know, you don't have this money at your disposal to be training multiple times per year, right? So you're going to do fine turning and you're going to do uh, prompt engineering. So prompt engineering is a technique used to guide the output of a language model provide specific prompt. It involves designing prompts that encourage the model to generate desired responses. So prompt engineers are commonly used by chatbots, content generation, and translation. So here's there some examples where you, you, you give an input to the LLM and you give an, and you receive an output. Um, you can do uh, some masking, like you can give him a template and ask him to fulfill the template. Uh, some modules you can say, hey, give me this on JSON. Um, there's some modules today that you can also give a text and it's going to give you some SQL back. Some modules can, you give some text, can give you images or even videos back. There's all sorts of things. Um, and this is the part where there's a lot of critique right now. It's around reasoning. Uh, they say that the modules are not really capable of reasoning. Um, some modules are better than others, but overall, you're going to see math reasoning is kind of a problem. Most of the open NLM models that you're going to find out there. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, there's some work to try to improve this. Now, let's talk about Hugging Face. Hugging Face is a big deal. Hugging Face is like the GitHub of machine learning nowadays, right? Uh, it's where you want to be and where all the cool things are happening. So Hugging Face has this thing called tasks which are things you can do, right? So just, just click on this link here. This is where you can see the magic, right? So there's a lot of things you can do, like here are the tasks you can do for computer vision. Here's what you can do for natural language processing. So you can do for audio, for multiple modules, for reinforcement learning, right? And, and you click one here, you're gonna have a lot of modules, old examples and a bunch of things. Let's say text to image, right? I want to be able to generate the image based on a text. So here it talks about the use cases and have some code with Python. You can just copy this code here and run it, right? So this is very, very, very useful. I highly recommend you guys create an account um, in Hugging Face. In the next video, I'm going to show some of the demos I did with Hugging Face. So here I have some, um, some of these tasks, right? So I'm using a predefined tasks um, for sentiment analysis. Uh, here I'm just passing the task, but ideally I should pass a model parameter to specify which model I'm going to use. Otherwise, you're going to use a default module, right? But you guys can see three lines of code, right? It's very, very easy. Um, then I'm passing this text, right? And I want to give me the sentiment score of that, right? And if you pay attention here, it's saying that it's positive and it's 99% sure that's positive. It's, it's quite good for three lines of code in Python, right? Now, let's talk about ONCs. ONCs is a very big deal in, in twofold, and I'm going to explain. So, ONCs is an open source format for representing deep learning modules. It allows modules to be trained in one full framework and deployed in another. So, literally, we could train in TensorFlow, use ONCs to export the model, and then we can run inference on PyTorch. So, that's one thing. So, you can switch backends. So in machine learning, you have this concept of backends that you might be running on PyTorch and TensorFlow or Keras or MXNet, right? And you might want to change the backend. But there's another thing here that's very cool. Usually data scientists uh, and folks working on the model probably going to be working with Python or are more to likely Python nowadays. Uh, but like engineers, you know, but they might be using different languages, right? Uh, and with, with, with ONCs, um, you can do uh, the model, let's say, in PyTorch, 
and you can run the inference in Java. And that's very, very cool. I did POCs uh, on that exactly direction and it's very easy to use. There's a CLI tool uh, with onks you can use uh, and you, can, you, you already can export like hugging face modules. It's like very, very easy to use. Uh, you can uh, train a module, like I said, in PyTorch, you can save the module, then you can load on longs and, and you know, generate this portable uh, module files. It's very, very neat. Um, so, onks, uh, uh, keep an eye on onks, and I highly recommend to use onks. Now, the next thing we need to talk about is called LangChain. LangChain is one of the things where it gets very interesting for us as engineers. Uh, because LangChain is a framework uh, that's designed to simplify creation and application of using lang uh, large language modules, LLMs. And uh, a language module integration framework, LangChain uses use case largely overlap with those language models in general, including document analysis, summarization, chatbots, embedding, and many more things. Right, so you can have access to the modules, you can have access to other chains, you can do prompt templating, engineering, you can access indexes, uh, agents. So in Java, there's this guy called Langchain for J. I highly recommend you guys take a look. It had a lot of integrations uh, with uh, Java ecosystem. It's very, very new, but very neat. Um, so keep in mind some of the things you can do with LangChain, right? So you can do some smooth integration between the Java applications that you already have and uh, your LLM modules, right? So LLMs can call Java, Java can call LLM for instance, right? So that's very cool. Uh, we can do some prompting templating. We can do output parsing. We can use patterns like uh, RAG and agents. Uh, and we can integrate also effect on uh, database, right? Like Pinecone, OpenSearch, Redis, PG Vector, and much more. Now, let's talk about RAG, right? So, RAG means retrieval argument generation. RAG fixes a problem which is uh, unfortunately LLMs eventually hallucinate. And um, they will produce false results, but they're going to look very good, right? So there's different kinds of hallucinations. Uh, one hallucination is like a factual hallucination, which is like the fact is uh, incorrect, period, right? So you get, let's like, say, a historical fact wrong. Like, for instance, for instance, say, like, the first person to walk on the moon was Charles Lindbergh, and actually was Neil Armstrong, right? So factually wrong. That's one kind of uh, hallucination. But another kind of hallucination uh, is more called faithfulness, Hallucination, it, it might depend on the prompt. Depending on the words that you use, you might trigger that uh, hallucination. So that's a different kind of hallucination. So LLMs are not good with fact checking because they cannot reason. They're not capable of reasoning uh, yet. Because remember, it's a na narrow AI. Um, so there is the fix with this architecture called RAG. So what will happen is like this. So imagine like you would ask a question to a chatbot or to a AON module, and then there will be some smart retriever which would get your text, create embeddings, and go to a knowledge base and ask questions about there, right? And get relevant documents and, and let's say fact checking, right? And then with that, then you go back to LLM and LLM would combine uh, that augmented generation with the LMM work, and then you would have a better informed answer that is also up to date. Uh, there is another benefit with RAG. It's not only that we are making um, the LLMs less hallucinogenous and, and reducing hallucination, but uh, we also reducing the cost, right? Because now uh, you have that in the knowledge base, is things you not necessarily need to train uh, the LLM, right? So this is a good way to reduce cost. And um, it's a good way also to deal with uh, enterprise systems, right? Because let's say you have your internal uh, Jira, uh, a lot of tickets and information, wiki pages there. Uh, you might have like Slack chats. You might have internal wiki pages, uh, code that you don't want to put on the internet. Uh, and you don't want to train the module because, you know, fine, tr fine training, pre-training costs a lot, right? Um, and, and that could be a way to overcome 
uh, such limitations, right? So this is good for a currency and also good for cost, right? So reg, uh, it's very interesting architecture. Now, this is kind of a new, right? Uh, I actually did the POC. Uh, so there's this new alternative for MLP, which is multi-layer perception. It's called CAN, uh, Komogorov Arnold Network, CAN. Uh, they claim it to be better alternative to MLP, um, that, you know, it can be uh, predictable, it can be easier um, to explain what's going on. Uh, and they say that's kind of like a big deal because uh, CAMs diverge from traditional MLP because they replace fiction activation functions with learnable functions and they eliminate the need of linear weight matrix, right? Um, I already seen some other neural networks, like I think I saw some convolutional networks already on top of CAN, uh, and uh, we should watch out. I think more things will come, and this might be quite interesting. Um, now, the other thing I want to talk about is called stable diffusion. So, stable diffusion works by interactively adding noise to an image and create a sequence of noise images. So the model learns uh, to denoise this image to recover from the original image, right? So you have an image, it keeps adding noise, and then the model needs to come back to the image, right? So this process is repeated multiple times and you can generate high quality images. And here's like one picture of the architecture. Stable diffusions, common models you might heard about is called stable diffusion tree from Stability AI. Uh, they are state of art in AI image generation. In OpenAI, there's DALI 2 and DALI 3. Meta has Imagine with Meta. Uh, Mid Journey is another popular one. Google just uh, released it, I think, Image 3. Uh, however, there's some challenge with stable diffusion, right? Uh, you might see, especially like the lower versions, like the 1.5 module, the module 1. You might see like issues on, on the hands, on the feet of the image you generate. I generated a horse and my horse, like the legs were kind of a funny. Uh, so you can see on my POCs, but the module is like 1.5, it's an older module. Uh, but uh, stable diffusion is very, very computationally intense. So it demands hardware a lot. Uh, and you might have like quarter variance and it is very complex. Okay. So the next network I want to talk about is called GAN, uh, Generative Adversarial Networks. Uh, so Generative Adversarial Networks, or GANs, are types of neural networks that are designed to generate new data. So they consist of two networks. There's a generator and a discriminator, and they compete between each other. So the generator creates a new uh, data sample, while the discriminator tries to distinguish between real and fake examples. All right. Um, GANs, uh, they have this pros because they are very good for synthetic data generation. They create high quality results um, and they have a lot of versatility. But uh, they have cons, like the training stability, it's computational cost, you can have overfitting, you can have biases and fairness problems, and you might have uh, inter interpretability and accountability problem. Just to make some quick comparison between uh, stable diffusion and GAN, uh, the main difference between the two methods is their approach generating new data. Stable diffusion uses a process of adding and removing noise to an image, and while GAN is a, is a game theoretic approach where uh, the two networks compete against each other. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is security, last but not least. Uh, OWASP already has a top 10 for LOM security, and this is the top 10 vulnerabilities that we need to watch for. Uh, the first one is prompt in injection, and to be careful with crafting inputs, causing unintended actions by the LOM. This can be easily done by sanitization and you know just having a system in the front of the LOM to check what the user is inputting. The next one is insecure output handling, which could lead to XSS, CRS and SSRF. Um, the next one is training data poisoning. LOM training data could be tempered. Um, I see some wild things about some images that are tempered or even like um, papers and documents that points to malicious websites and things like that, right? 
but uh, luckily, like a lot of the models are there, are, are watching for this kind of things, right? Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, fine training is very expensive. Usually, people don't do fine training. They might uh, pre-training. They might do fine turning, right? But still, you need to watch the quality of data that you're feeding to the model. Uh, the next one is model denial of service. So that actor might use and his source heavy operations on EOM to either infer a lot of cost on you or uh, or make the LLM freak out. Um, there is a super chain vulnerabilities like this is like classical security for like third party database. Like say if we use uh, vector database, it's still a database, right? The database needs to be batched and be secure. Um, um, pretended models and plugins can also have uh, vulnerabilities, like in the case of Langchain, you're coding in, in a language, right? And and you have code there, so you have libraries, libraries can have vulnerabilities, you need to be up to date and things like that. Um, there is sensitive information disclosure, some LLMs might inevitably review confidential data and through responses, unauthorized data access, private violations, and secret breaches. I know like um, some LLMs have like models and other LLMs to help them to not do something like that. I know like GitHub uh, Copilot has like uh, proxies between and, and after the LLM and they even have like a, a module like to make sure like SQL injection doesn't reach the LLMs and things like that, right? Um, insecure, insecure plugin design. Uh, LLM plugin can have insecure inputs and a sufficient access control in the case of agents and regs, like for instance, uh, excessive agency, so excessive functionality, permissions, autonomy granted to LLM based systems, like, um, you know, like if the LLM is user facing, you know, attackers can use that as a vector, but if the LLM is internally and use an LLM, let's say, to generate code or generate tests or code review or other internal uh, not customer facing tasks, this is quite safe. Uh, over reliance, uh, misinformation, miscommunication, legal issues, and security vulnerabilities. Uh, there is this case on the internet. I don't know if you guys heard about it, but it's this guy who pulled some of these chatbots that was LLM based uh, to sell a car for $1. Uh, that's a quite popular one, right? But this all could be uh, caught with sanitization and just, you know, have a proxy in front of the LLM. And finally, it's model theft. Uh, so unauthorized access, copying, exfiltration, uh, proprietary LOM modules as well. It is also related uh, if you can uh, have some temporary data on the pre-training, uh, then later on could be exfiltrated, right? All LOM uh, vendor companies are watching these kind of things, but security is everybody's job. We also need to be watching for this and more. So this is the end of the second video. Now we finish the Gen AI notebook. On the next video, I'm actually going to go through the POCs and through the demos, right? So thank you so much, guys. Take care. Cheers.